Hello, and welcome to the first online webinar by Cornwall AOMB's A Monumental Improvement Project. My name is Stuart Oates, and I'll be hosting you today for around about an hour. Now, the project is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, Historic England, Cornwall Council, the National Trust, and the Cornwall Heritage Trust. It's seeking to tackle the current limited understanding of scheduled monuments in Cornwall as sites of national archaeological significance. During the lifespan of the project, we hope to help stabilise 40 sites which are currently on Historic England's Heritage at Risk Register or classified as vulnerable. Monumental improvement, like many heritage projects, relies on the support of local communities and volunteers to succeed. In turn, projects such as these provide opportunities for people to make new connections, learn new skills and get outside in the landscape. The pandemic has sparked an increase in demand for green spaces and a desire to connect with nature. Heritage Projects creates a unique opportunity for working in the landscape and connecting with a wider audience. Today, we'll be joined by a panel of professionals working on heritage projects in Cornwall to speak about their work and their experiences in helping to connect people to their local landscapes and the benefits to be had from engaging people in heritage. We will also be talking about ways in which you can get involved and help support monumental improvement and similar projects in your area. Now, throughout all of this, you'll see that there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of this webinar Please do ask anything you want on there and we'll do our best to answer your questions throughout. So let's get right to it. I'll just enable all of our speakers' videos and uh, we'll get them all on board and I'll introduce you. And we're all here, here we go. <laughs> so uh, to introduce everyone, James Gossip is the Senior Archaeologist at Cornwall Archaeological Unit. He's been working in archaeology since the late 80s, specialising in excavation and survey. Over the past 10 years, he's been involved with a lot of community archaeology um, projects involving volunteers wherever possible. In his spare time, he runs the Minig Archaeology Group, a community, -focused, a community group focused on projects on the Lizard. He's currently the lead archaeologist for the AONB Monumental Improvement Project. Now, Laura Ratcliffe Warren is the ancient Penwith officer for Penwith Landscape Partnership. Her background is in archaeological conservation, both in the field and in museums and conservation labs, with a particular interest in archaeological objects and the various stages of processing them from identification and stabilization to repair work and getting them on display to the public. She's also a long history of working with volunteers in on excavations. Next up, we have Jim Parry, who's an archaeology consultant for the National Trust. Uh, Jim's interest started in archaeology as a kid when ferreting around in an old Victorian bottle dump in a ne nearby quarry finding all sorts of fascinating rubbish, which, to be honest, Jim, sounds incredibly dangerous. Um, uh, moving on some 40 odd years later, after university, he spent a long stint working in commercial archaeology for a number of companies and the Welsh Archaeological Trusts. He then came to the National Trust as their archaeological advisor for Cornwall and Devon. And finally, we have Ian Rowe, who's a learning officer for Cornwall Council. Ian works within Cornwall's Archive Centre, and he's the area representative coordinator for Cornwall Archaeological Society. He's the former officer for Historic Environment and the learning officer for, uh, on Carradon Hill Area Heritage Project. So thank you very much for all, uh, all for joining us. Uh, we'll get straight to it. James, you're up first. We're using very big words here already. Let's go right back to the beginning. Can you tell us what is monumental improvement and why is it so important? Okay, well, um, it's an initiative that was um, launched by Cornwall AOMB, uh, looking at 40 uh, sites that are on the Heritage at Risk Register. So this is something that Historic England compiles uh, where they, uh, they look at certain scheduled monuments uh, that are in particular need of help. Um, they're vulnerable for one reason or another. It could be vegetation or coastal erosion or, or footfall or um, animals, digging them up and that sort of thing. And what monumental improvement seeks to do is to, um, by carrying out uh, further survey work and um, that kind of thing, clearance to help... Um, and interpret them a bit better and make them more accessible to the public. 
Great. And Jim, you work for the National Trust. Why is monumental improvement important for them? It's important for uh, a number of reasons, but probably topmost is is that we carry on making these places um, uh, accessible uh, to everyone. Um, most of them are in, in our open access landscapes. And on top of that is the trying to understand them to the fullest so we can really share uh, the understanding of, of how these landscapes, how our, um, in particular in terms of this program, the Monumental Improvement one, how a lot of our coastal sites have been um, adapted and changed over time by human, you know, they're not purely natural in form. Um, and how that tells a story of, of how humans have adapted to change through time as well. Great. And uh, Laura, now you're not directly involved with this project, but you're working on a very similar project at the moment. So give us a little insight into your project and some of your successes so far. Okay, so we're uh, based in West Penrith, the Penrith Landscape Partnership that was uh, conceived uh, 2014, um, was back when it all started. A group of community interest um, organisations got together and decided uh, what was it about the West Penrith landscape that was particularly important and how to um, perhaps help, help improve it and help uh, tell people about it. And of the 13 project strands, um, pretty much all of which we work with uh, community groups on. Um, one of them is Ancient and With, uh, the, work, the work that I do particularly, which is some elements of it very closely sort of um, mirror what, what, what James and, and what um, Jim were saying about the Monumental Improvement Project. So um, looking after sort of vegetation on some monuments, uh, particularly ones deemed at risk, again, um, for sort of access or vegetation or erosion, perhaps, uh, some of them on the coast, again, uh, but quite a lot inland as well on the moors. Um, and most importantly for us, particularly in West Penrith, it's the sort of living historic landscape. So, so many elements of it are really ancient, but it's still being used today. Um, those ancient elements are still sort of active, as it were, they're sort of historic boundaries that are still being used as boundaries. They're not sort of relics, they're, they're sort of living, living monuments, if you like. So we've got this sort of extra dimension of, of every, everybody using it as well. So we're sort of finding more out about the monuments, but helping people who live and work there um, manage, manage their land better to be sympathetic to monuments and also for, for biodiversity as well. It's very important. Great. And um, you mentioned people a lot there. Uh, Ian, oh. you've worked on many learning projects for Cornwall Council. Um, why do you think it's so important that we do our best to help spread awareness about heritage locally? It's, 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 um, it's brilliant what, what Laura said. The, the people, you know, people live in the landscape and they, 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 they maybe walk their dogs where they go through that. We don't actually, they don't know the story behind it. And I think the key thing is learning the story behind it. And and we do, I mean, I do, I'm, I work at the record office, so I'm working with um, history, so I'm, and James and I put a prehistory um, workshop together, which is, which is fantastic. But I think to get people out there and to just talk about it, I mean, Cornwall's got 1,350 odd um, shed related monuments, more than any other county, uh, you know, in, in, in Britain. So we've got, we've, we've got loads more. So. So I think it's, um, and they're all, you know, some are very big, some are very small, some are easy to identify, some are not. Um, but it's just to um, yeah, to talk about the, the story behind those monuments. So, um, and we've, um, you know, whether that's painting or photographs or, you know, whatever really, it's just just really to get the story across about those monuments. And and a, the A and is about much more than just scheduled monuments. I know that, but um, and it's just it's it's some the, the sites are they're um, preserving and James is working with are amazing sites, you know. And uh, so yeah, so there's, there's just um, I think that the most difficult thing is to get that get that story across to people. I think the reason why we get the story across to people is we need to just work a little bit differently possibly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Jim, why do you think that it's so important in Cornwall that we protect our heritage sites and allow them to be sort of ask, accessed by the public? Um, would, would, would 
just saying, Ian was just saying that we want to be able to maybe do things a little bit different. Do you see the National Trust is can be doing something to help promote things in a different way to try and really get people to understand their environment around them? Yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. And they're, they're very active in pursuing um, how we communicate and understand um, our places and monuments in as many different ways as possible. Um, there's, you know, they, they run all sorts of national programs um, with uh, on f working from many different fields, whether it's, you know, the historic environment or natural environment. Um, but it's, it's, you know, we've, um, we try to work, I think, on as many different levels as possible. Um, the beauty about archaeology and heritage is that it's a, it's a sort of smorgasbord of options. Um, it's, it, all it is, is uh, in its simplest form, is the sort of remnants of human life. And so what you're exploring and what you're seeing covers every single facet of that. And all of that is there to explore, uh, to be interpreted and explained. Um, so, you know, every, there is, as, as much as other people are referring to, there's nothing like being able to go out there with people actually out into the landscape, um, whether it's talking about it, pointing out those rather dull looking lumps and bumps which actually might be, you know, something much more uh, dramatic or exciting. Um, not that my kids would necessarily agree, but um, the uh, to, um, you know, maybe getting a bit more Indiana Jonesy and, and getting your hands in the dirt, um, digging stuff up, finding things, handling objects that maybe haven't seen the light of day, you know, for 50 to you know, 1,000, 2,000 years. Um, uh, but also that, you know, the, the methods by which we can do this, um, you know, and a lot of this has particularly come to light in the last last year or so, that, um, that there's digital ways and means as well that we can make, whether it's our, you know, collections that maybe come from our, our sites, that some of them are sitting in museums, some of them sitting in boxes like those behind James at the moment. Um, to uh, um, you know, digital recreations, animation, all of those things, and th these are all things that Trust is is busy exploring. It's it's done various exhibitions on bits and pieces. Um, we're doing a rather exciting project with with some partners down uh, in West Cornwall as well at the moment um, at Levant, looking at you know how we can digitally cre recreate um, you know the industrial landscapes and. Uh, doing virtual reality underground and all those kinds of things so yeah very much so um, an ever-expanding field I would say um, and a very exciting one at that. Yes for sure and um, it's, it's, it's something where this is all being created but how, how can people get involved with monumental improvement? James is it all digging holes with trowels? It isn't um, that that's uh, that's a lot of fun um, and that's how I got into it. But um, no, it isn't. There's all sorts of ways that people can get involved. And, and as Jim said, um, it's the getting involved that really helps. Um, and, and Ian touched on helps bring the story to life and, and get it over to people. Uh, and I'm a I'm a big believer in the mantra that the past belongs to everybody. And I think in the past, a lot of the general public um, didn't have an avenue. In the, to, to get involved in a practical sense but we can do all sorts of things and we're doing them uh, through the monumental improvement project such as site clearance so we're taking people out there um, to help expose these sites again these ones that have got overgrown with brambles and gorse and bracken and everything else um, we're running um, survey training workshops so people can actually uh, learn some of the practical skills and how to capture the information um, and help the interpretation. Um, we, we're inviting people to carry out guided walks, that sort of thing. If there's a, someone has a particular interest uh, in their, their um, local history, uh, they probably know a hell of a lot more about it than we do. Um, and um, we can encourage them to actually uh, get involved and take people out and uh, help us understand these sites as well. And we're also including people in some of our desk-based research um, covering the projects uh, in the site um, on the for the project um, 
and um, that includes cliff castles and um, the World War II airfield up at Perrinpour, for instance, is being looked at by a, a student from Truro College at the moment. And we, we hope to develop these ideas really and um, make them more available to, to more people. And in addition to that, there is some of the digging holes in the ground, we hope, in the future and getting your trowel out. Uh, and at the moment, I'm writing a project design for um, some excavation work we hope to carry out at King Arthur's Hall on Bodmin Moor. Um, on Emblance Downs, which is a particularly enigmatic site that um, really nobody properly understands. It doesn't have any firm parallels, certainly not in Britain. Uh, and um, there will be an opportunity, we hope, to carry out a bit of excavation work there. Um, and for that, we'll be asking for volunteers. Great. And so I'm actually going to uh, go straight to a question from one of our viewers, actually, if you don't mind. Uh, I know we're really we're supposed to wait till the end for the questions, but this is quite relevant right now. So for the panel from Michael uh, Wurenga, uh, excuse me, Michael, if I've said your name wrong, I apologize. Um, as Cornwall is lived in and visited by a disparate number of people, how do you feel that there is a, a dissonance uh, on the weight of that heritage? And how do we apply relevance to a varied audience? Who can pick that up? What do we reckon? Come on, Ian. You've smiled too much. You can, you can answer that one. <laughs> how do we apply, um, how do we make heritage relevant to everyone who comes to Cornwall? Well, we're, this people is what we're who've been generations. Uh, yeah, we're trying to do this at Crescent Current at the moment, like, you know, is, is to look at black history, look at the whole. I mean, I, I recently had my DNA um, tested and I'm, I'm more Devon than Cornish. My DNA, which is awkward for me, to be honest with you. But, <laughs> um, but also, I'm um, linked to the uh, Samoy people who were the reindeer in you know, my ancient DNA, goes right back through. So, so, I think everyone's history is it probably comes back to me. You know, I, I don't, it's a very, very tough one to say, isn't it? Really, I don't, I mean, our um, we can look back and, and the, the workshop I did with James, uh, with James, is all looking at um. How stages of history go on and prehistory goes on uh, to today but we're all from different we, we all come from different places you know basically and i think we just need to agree and live together and you know realize that we're all from the same place i think you know that i agree and i think that's the the, the value of archaeology is that it's often uh debunking um stories that that have been created through the process of history you know of the of the story making process that that um and being reinforced by sort of political um aspirations and things like that um and you know a, a good example is you know so one of the sites that, that sits as part of the this project the monumental improvement project down at Gumwallo, um it's a site that you know on first glance is is a sort of a promontory um, a promontory fort, so you're kind of talking sort of Iron Age, Bronze Age period um, that's eroding into the sea. But the story there is much more than uh, just Iron Age stroke Bronze Age, um, you know, and the concept of what promontory forts are. They're very coastal, they're all out looking. Um, and from previous excavations we've done immediately adjacent to the site, um, the site also has this church set into the back of the promontory for called the church of storms um uh and the name gumwallow itself comes from someone called saint winwallow uh saint winwallow or uh, or saint Genole, which comes actually from a uh, monastery in Brittany. and all of the connections when you start looking closer at the archaeological material even looking at the site types the parallels are actually in in a lot of ways greater with france than you may see than in inland Cornwall. Um, and hence, you know, you, you can start exploring stories around cultural connections um, that end up being much broader than uh, a perceived county identity um, and allows you to break down potentially or, or have much more broader discussions rather than being um, locked in by sort of geopolitical uh, thought, thoughts. Yeah, uh, yeah. If I just 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 carry on from that, really, Jim. I mean, isn't everything we look at um, 
just telling us that there is constant change all the time anyway. People are coming and going. And, yep. um, and we just hope to be able to tell the story of that um, through the archaeology without any, um, you know, uh, any historical and nonsense getting in the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many ancient parts of Cornwall that people think, oh, it's a perfect fossilised historic kind of, you know, there's all these little fossilised pockets of history. And, and yet that backbone of, of what made Cornwall a place to be it, uh, through, throughout kind of human history, really, I mean, there's been constant communication between Cornwall and, and Europe and as far away as the Middle East uh, with tin trading. Certainly they found tin ingots uh, from sort of 4,000 years ago in, in, in the Middle East. So it was quite possible that it was being sent to the, sort of the Egyptian pyramids, sort of, you know, mm. so many, so many links. And, and little, little snippets of that do turn up in the archaeological record at uh, Roman vessels, bits of amphora. Um, Phoenician ware from before then. Um, yeah, quite quite astonishing, really. Such a small place. People think it's quite inward looking, but actually it is it is what it is because everybody was so outward looking, really, I think. And being able to tell that story every time you find a little bit bit more, it, it just it, it just reinforces that idea. It was so connected. People really were speaking from huge distances yeah. for a really long time. You know, the populations weren't sort of stale. They were quite dynamic, I suspect. Quite forward thinking in some ways. Fantastic. So it's, it's uh, not it's not sorry, it's not directly linked to the monumental improvement project, but it is linked to the to uh, volunteer engagement. And uh, when we worked at Tintagel um, a few years ago, um, where we where we were exposing all our volunteer team to all this mass of material that came to us from the Mediterranean and beyond. Um, you know what we're looking at there is uh, the largest collection of pottery imported from that part of the world in Britain, and that is uh, and that's sitting on Tintagel Headlands itself on Tintagel Island, um, and uh, that uh, if nothing else that really reflects I think. Uh, how important Cornwall was to a much wider world than people have thought in recent um, you know, recent years. Um, why don't we, uh, so I'm going to go straight to another question from Janet Freeman, because it again links perfectly. Thank you, viewers. You are asking these questions in a very logical way. I appreciate that. It's helping us out. So uh, Janet says, I always advise holiday makers to go and see all of the mines or the stone circles, but very few are interested. They go to Land's End or St. Ives and complain about the crowds and the car park charges instead. How can we generate more interest without marketing tricks? And clearly you guys here have got a huge amount of passion and uh, I'm ready to get out there and go and start digging holes and learning a bit more about my heritage here in Cornwall. But how do we get it to the public? How do we make them involved? How do we try and engage them now? And this is an opportunity in this, um, this uh, project. What do we do? It's difficult, isn't it? Because we're, we're probably preaching to the converted at the moment. <laughs> yes. Um, everybody that's engaging with your with this webinar at the moment, uh, loves all that stuff and they love getting out there. And they all understand that archeology span has the power to captivate, um, as does uh, this your, your person with the question. Um, it's just her guests that don't. So I don't know, it's very difficult, but it's, um, I guess it's a major part really of what's going to be the delivery stage of the Monumental Improvement Project is to, um, is to help, um, make people more aware of some of these incredibly important sites that we've got down here but um, you know maybe the others have got something more to say on that well we're, we're three years in now and we've we've started putting some information out there on our website for the landscape partnership uh, um we're sort of yeah some of the the work that we're doing that you're just starting really with monumental improvements has started to bear sort of intellectual fruit if you like we're finding out more about the sites and able to perhaps tell people a little bit more and um part of a lot a lot of what we're doing is promoting walk it walks in the area so we've got a, a number of walks that were specifically designed because they had things of interest on them so they start from places that are easy to easy to park at things like that that link up with perhaps bus routes that's that's always a good one um trying to avoid people sort of 
bringing huge amounts of vehicles into a sort of into a landscape that might not appreciate that so much <laughs> if, if at all possible um but we, we're not just focusing on one thing it's, the, the sites are very interesting but what what has allowed them to survive is the landscape that they're sitting in perhaps and the habitats around them and that that might be another way in for people perhaps they're interested in bird watching but hadn't realized that one of their favorite watching spots was in fact a scheduled monument and Actually, that's quite interesting. Once people are interested in one element of the landscape, um, it quite often, yeah, that they, they become then further interested in, in in other bits of it. So, sort of aiming different themed walks as well is something we're sort of thinking of doing. So, I'm I'm in the middle of working up some uh, children a children's trail. So, what one of our walking trails I'm doing a specific guide for the children that all. Make, turn, turn the walk into a story basically so they can sort of move through the landscape and at a level that they might find more engaging perhaps than just have you seen this bird have you seen this monument that turn left at the funny tree you know that it's yeah. fairly dry unless you have a backlog of knowledge in your brain with which to interpret what you're looking at so definitely finding different ways of encouraging people to go out I mean we're, we're doing artists sort of excursions going out with an artist or a poet or um, perhaps doing some storytelling in the landscape and just things like that just and anything really to spark people's imagination there's, there's so much to play for like um like Jim has been saying earlier just like it's a smorgasbord of potential we just have to get quite creative and, and lockdown has allowed us to get a bit more creative I think which has been quite a nice thing to to be able to spend time thinking about actually yeah, and and actually building on that, I think um, one of the elements that there's there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that this type of thing is amazingly good for mental health and well-being, um, connecting with nature and the world around you. Um, in fact, this kind of goes into um, a councillor uh, Keith Hambly State, uh, who's asked the question: um, How can we engage with older people who may not be may not be housebound, but their mobility is restricted? Um, what part can heritage and its associated stories help with the well-being of these people and, and other people as well? I mean, have you got any examples where you've really seen this um, happen before, where you've really seen really positive outcomes? Ian, you've done a lot of um, educational things. Um, do, you, do you have any examples where you've really thought that's gone really well? I work with a, a, a not-for-profit company called um, Memory Matters, so they work with people with uh, early onset dementia, really, or, or newly diagnosed with dementia. And we've obviously I work at an archive, so we're talking about history, but we've moved towards prehistory now. Uh, and the, the workshop I, I, I did with James, um, I've kind of changed it slightly, but yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's been a quite amazing that the, the the response from people that they they. <sighs> They may walk their dog and they go through sites they don't realize you know you know like the hurlers for example and binions a, a massive example there that people walk through there and they realize that one when i was talking to um people from st Austin area and they've been to minions and didn't realize that their hurlers stone circle was bronze age you know so so by talking to so that's hopefully when they go back again they realize you know where it sits in the um prehistory of of, of cornwall and um uh, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a big thing about getting, getting, just getting people into the landscape and talking to them about it. I mean, James is brilliant at this, is, and, and so is Laura. When we did the excavations at the Hurlers, um, you get so many people who just, they're just walking a dog when they come through, and they you know, they've probably walked through there 50, 60, 70, 80 times a year, and they don't realise what's there until there's, there's people there to talk to them about it. So, so it's, it's all about communication, but in the right way. I don't think, you know, um, um, notice boards and you know interpretation is the best way but um thinking differently with um like laura said with di digital interaction uh, apps possibly you know these sorts of things i know that doesn't affect everyone from from from, from an older age but it's um yeah it's it's um it's, it's quite a tricky one with with older people I, I really i really do realize that but i think if we can perhaps get into their homes and talk to them about it that they will get out there and do it have a look yeah i think there's a lot as well from um tied in with uh how our various organizations and and groups are networked so that um more effective ways can be found to 
work with you know what might be your organization's non-traditional um audience um so you know i mean it's possibly slightly different for some of the national trusts we kind of oh, we've got to have something like forty-five thousand volunteers that work for us across a very broad age range but if you are specifically uh addressing people who are much more older and infirm um where a lot of it really relies is is on understanding what those needs are and as we've already kind of alluded to as a group that the opportunities are actually endless you know there's there's a lot of huge amounts of digital resources um uh, available a lot of which you know our various organizations are actively developing and there's some very active ways of getting directly engaged with those even if you're just have, um sitting at home you don't necessarily need to go outdoors but also the kind of resources um, that are available to explore and understand what's outside your front door um and you know quite often there's also um sort of community projects uh that are you know people are saying what have you dug up in your you know in your back garden you know bits of pottery and glass and things like that all of which um you know can be pulled together to tell stories and understand how your, your locality is developed um like i say as well as the more maybe ambitious of more digital projects you know we have um whether it's sort of uh digital surveys of, of sort of landscapes and people can participate in those to try and identify what you know what certain lumps and bumps are on the ground and quite often actually from the older generation you do get you know there's still that very active memory of, of particularly immediately post-war of someone going oh you know that that's where joe blogs buried the tank that broke down on the way to a practice field or something or something like that and you know and you know the the the, the truth you know comes out in fact I, if i've if I tell you, i've got a lovely story about that i was um i was maybe slightly semi-gruesome um but not not too bad uh but i was called down to a um uh, a nearby beach because uh, someone re reported some um, human remains um, being exposed um, and so we got the relevant um, permissions and licenses and I went down there to remove them you know it's a relatively common occurrence on our and um, all our coastal sites and um, but I went down to have a look and it wasn't it wasn't human it did look like it a bit when you first approached it but with a bit of um excavation turned out to be a cow burial and i was on the way uh, i was on the way back to the uh back to the car and i bumped into the um bumped into the farmer who who lived in a house top of the road and he says oh, oh i'll go and get my dad so his his his, his dad hobbled out in his frame and, and saying oh he says yeah yeah i remember that he said that's when um uh, that's the that's the remainder of the cow from uh, 1946, I think it was, or something like that. And a a, mu a munition ship had um, uh, some of the cargo got washed up on the beach. The locals had collected the munitions and had stored them on the um, top of the cliff edge. Obviously, the uh, it had become slightly unstable because it got wet, and a cow was sort of nosing around it, set off the <laughs> explosives which created a huge great big hole the cow ended up in a nearby at the top of a nearby tree um <laughs> the cow, it was so high up they couldn't get it down so they had to wait for it to um slowly uh disassemble itself and the stories about the cowbell you know blowing in the wind and things like this and anyway um the, 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 what made it quite interesting because when we were excavating the site, we, we found, you know, there was a there was a bit of leg bone, and then there was a, there was a shoulder in another bit, and it was it was a bit scattered, but it all made sense because what they'd then done is gathered the pieces and put it back in the explode in the bomb crater as well, which is why we had this kind of slightly weird shaped cut. But they, you know, it's it's the kind of there's a lot around stories that could be gained from other generations things like this and it is it's establishing those mechanisms and networks to bring this together which also brings up brings them to life as well rather than maybe you know a dry boring bearded archaeologist going mm -hmm. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah you yeah. are quite dull my you, goodness yeah <laughs> you, you, you probably want you probably want to move it on uh, Stuart, but uh, just leading on from what jim was saying really i think 
I think uh, it's always a challenge um, trying to involve people that are, that are perhaps a bit more infirm in the practical things we do. But as he says, and Ian says, the, the archaeology is all around us. And they've only got to step outside their front doors sometimes to be able to see and understand the past. Um, and I have to say as well that uh, after 20 or so years of working with volunteers, the vast majority of the people that can get involved in the heavy digging work with our excavations are over the age of 65. Uh, so I think there's something to be said for getting out there in the in the great outdoors for keeping you very fit. Super. Uh, actually, so I, I, you kind of, I think you've answered two of our questions here, um, which is um, one of them is like, how can Cornish people um, show their, uh, sorry, be encouraged to be proud of their heritage and how can Cornish culture be incorporated into the project? But I guess a lot of that comes through these stories. Uh, a lot of that comes through uh, the, the, the background to the thing you find and, and, and goes from there. But I don't know if you've got any other ways that you think that Cornish culture can be, it will be included in this project. Well, that's the, 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 the stories that we uncover um, going back to the, the first settlings in Cornwall 10,000 years ago, up to the, the most recent uh, project on our, on our um, site, on our list, on our project list, which is Perrinporth Airfield. They, they do exactly that. They tell the story of Cornish culture over millennia um, and how it changes and how um, it has interacted with the wider world. Um, you know, and so I think, um, I think we do that already. And hopefully what the Monumental Improvement Project will do is just kind of embed um, that, um, th those stories and the stories of Cornish culture and history um, and make it more accessible to everybody. I think it's quite exciting, you know, as a project as well, it's quite exciting because it's got quite a broad geographical spread. Um, and as James said, you know, it's got a, a variety of different site types as well. So we are, you know, stretching from prehistory to to effective almost up to Cold War period. And there's um, uh, by doing that, it's, um, you know, it incorporates all a whole range of uh, the evolution of Cornish, Cornishness, Cornish identity, um, however you want to call it, through through time in all sorts of little snippets and in different environments, but, you know, which all have their own specific um, identities and quirks. Right, and so uh, we've kind of sort of covered uh, a lot of ground here, but now we're going to go back into um, how are we going to help in, engage volunteers? So what projects specifically are happening um, around that people can get involved with? Someone here has said um, they want to know a little, Jocelyn uh, Murgatroyd has said, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the King Arthur's Hall project, um, which is in development, and also any other projects um, that the AOMB Cornwall Council or other bodies are running or hoping to start soon in North Cornwall, um, but I'm sure for everyone else, they want to know other parts of Cornwall too. Are there going to be any training opportunities? Um, what's, what's coming up? What can people look forward to? Okay, um, I guess that's one for me to start with anyway. Um, so King Arthur's Hall, it's um, uh, an enigmatic site, as I said, I think um, nobody really knows when it was built or what it was used for. Um, some people believe it's prehistoric, um, perhaps built in the Bronze Age. Other people believe it was a medieval uh, stock pound uh, between two manors. And um, there, there is a local group already active on Bodmin Moor called the Time Seekers, um, and they've they've uh, helped push the uh, the need to find out more about King Edward's Arthur's Hall to the fore. Um, and how we would like to help is by carrying out some excavation work. Bearing in mind this is a scheduled monument, and you have, there are a lot of permissions you have to put in place to get uh, any excavation carried out at a scheduled monument. But um, carry out some excavation that will enable us to access buried soils and things below the bank of the monument that we can perhaps um, carry out some scientific dating on. So we're going to use a technique hopefully called optically stimulated luminescence and I'm not going to go into the science of that and potentially some uh, radiocarbon dating as well that everybody's heard about I'm sure. 
um, and see whether we can find a date for the origins of King Arthur's Hall and uh, perhaps how it, how it developed over time, because often our sites don't have just one primary um, function, but they, they change uh, depending on the needs of the community through time. Um, and, um, and we're also going to look outside the monument at some recent geophysics that's been carried out by the Time Seekers, um, uh, where we're going to carry out a test pitting exercise. And that's a great thing for volunteers that are, you know, may consider themselves unskilled, uh, but it's a great way for them to get involved in the actual practical digging side of things. Um, so we're going to be doing that. And we're going to be carrying out some um, survey training days as well. We've been working a lot at um, Dingerine on Roseland, Dingerine Castle, where we're going to carry out some survey training and uh, at a, um, an Iron Age or Romano British round into Hiddy Woods. Um, and um, yeah, uh, lots of sites really where we're hopefully going to carry out these sorts of, these sorts of tasks, training, clearance, and possibly excavation. Super. Laura, you've been uh, obviously at this for three years already. Um, and you've, um, can you give me examples of projects that you've kind of been doing and what people have got involved with? But also, when you're designing a project, how uh, do you make, do you include the idea that you're trying to help people now uh, and their well being in, in your, the designing of your project? Um, well, I think uh, a lot of the thinking behind the project and the, the voluntary work that we're doing, not just with the archaeology sites, but with a number of other things, was that we would try and upskill the community that lives in West Penwith so that they would be interested, they'd have the knowledge of what was around them, but also that we would do training as well so that they had skills that were transferable to the sort of the lives that they might have around around that landscape. So we, we do, do a lot of training um, either in archaeological sort of field skills if, if we're doing field work or um, a lot of um, species identification, sort of insects, birds, plants, that sort of thing. Um, the use of tools is a firm fact people like scything who knew scything is like the new sport of choice in west <laughs> um, yeah we, we will quite possibly be um, working with our colleagues over at, at monumental improvements to uh, spread the scything love um, i know there's even cormac in our scything at the side of roads over streaming um, oh my goodness. It, it really is a fantastic activity and people really enjoy it and it's uh, it's good fun um, and it's quite easy to social distance with a scythe because you, you really don't want to get <laughs> <laughs> to anybody with an active scythe. <laughs> it certainly keeps you on your toes as well as uh, yeah, giving you an appreciation of what's going on around you. Um, so we've, we've done a lot of successful site clearance and, and I think um, not only is it finding out about the site as well, like, oh, these like, like um, Jim has been saying, like lumps and bumps, you know, what are they? Did you know that this is what you're looking at? People are quite often surprised. And then because you're an archaeologist, you're like, why are you surprised? It's obviously like this specific type of stone. Um, so it's, it's always a joy to be able to spread that kind of knowledge out so that people really get excited about what they're looking at. But it's like a discovery. It's not as fancy as excavating, perhaps, but you're discovering a monument that's perhaps been covered for 70 years, maybe longer. Um, and that's that's a quite joyful, quite a joyful experience that our volunteers are really get behind, actually. Um, we've got some some people who, you know, you look at the site and you think, oh, that's a bit gnarly. I'm not sure I'd enjoy. I'm not sure I'd enjoy that if we got enough biscuits to keep everyone going. <laughs> but, um, Sometimes those really awful sites are the ones that, that excite people the most because they really see the results. Um, it, it's, it's, yeah, really exciting. Um, and and tra training in sort of archaeological interpretation, like um, James is doing, he mentioned surveying. Um, that, that's really good for having people look at the landscape and understand a bit about what they're seeing. And, and then you can transfer that to the rest of the landscape as you're walking through it. And it's like, it's... Uh, it's a bit like a kind of breadcrumb trail. If you do enough little bits and pieces, actually it starts to build up a really exciting bigger picture. Um, even if it's just a, 
learning how to use new sort of tools for managing vegetation or learning to survey stuff or doing a bit of desk based research. We had an incredibly successful research sort of training day up what Ian was involved in up at Crescent Kerno that really, really excited people about archives and delving into the history of the sites through the archive um, route. Because getting out and about, like, like um, people were saying earlier, is, isn't for everyone. Perhaps people are not so mobile or it's not, not for them. There's other ways of engaging with the environment. Uh, research is, is a really good one. And um, a lot of Cornish place names and things like that that we can get from old maps and th things that sort of join the dots, the sort of slightly more intangible stuff rather than just the sort of nuts and bolts of an archaeological site. So there's yeah, all sorts, all sorts that we can um, we can do. And and if, if we can possibly set up some sort of training for people, um, then we are trying to do that. We've got you know, all sorts of things that we might do that are a bit surprising, but it's just another way of looking at the landscape. And we'll be doing dowsing, I think, from this from this summer, which is it really interesting. I've done that on quite a few archaeological sites, and it's quite it's quite quite an exciting way of looking at the site. It's certainly very different, not not for everybody, um, as well as the sort of more scientific surveying sort of mechanisms. Yeah, hey. so all so sorts of think, different ways, really. Um, have you found it's been quite easy to attract people? Um, John Moss on here said, uh, "Is there a trick to appealing to more people to help clear sites?" Um, CASPN has been looking after sites in Penwith for over 15 years and still has problems attracting people to help with oh. exciting stuff like digging holes. Uh, I like the idea of mini talks to describe the sites, but the challenge is getting people there in the first place. We have over 3,000 followers on Facebook, but mostly we can only get a half a dozen to, to a clear up. Uh, so do you think there's any tricks to this? Uh, Jim, you've got, you're with the National Trust, you've got volunteers coming out your ears. What? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how do you get I, them there? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. Well, can we have yeah. them? <laughs> um, I think a lot of them like the biscuits and tea in the houses. No, that, 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 that's that's not entirely true. The um, I, I know our, our ranger team work work with Caspen uh, as well to to uh, help with sites, but um, it's uh, I think sometimes it's the it. It could be tied in with a lot of the issues here. It could be tied in with geography, um, you know, particularly down in West Cornwall. Um, uh, probably less surprising at the moment that not many people, <laughs> uh, people probably shouldn't be that much out and about <laughs> clearing <laughs> sites necessarily. But we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting to our butterfly moment. Um, but uh, it, it, is, it is a real challenge. I'd agree it is a real challenge. And actually that there is a real challenge in, maintaining uh that interest so you might be able to and and maybe you know uh, well in fact all of you are probably all aware of this but the it's sometimes starting off these things is one thing um and you might get an initial flush of interest and that could be prompted because of some uh talks or some leaflets or things like that but to be able to uh maintain uh, that level of interest and to really start making those of that more long-term difference to these sites so going trying to get groups to go out to them more regularly really keeping on top of it so that you know you don't clear a site and then two years later it's, it's disappeared again um, uh, is 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 a very real challenge and um, I wish I had the magic answer to it um, I don't I do think probably um, good company nice weather um uh, maybe there'll be a bit more interest in in the coming year as, as people uh, uh feel a bit more released and and you know want to and you know kind of need to get out there and um uh maybe that will that, that kind of thing will be will uh benefit from that interest um but yeah, it, it's, uh, I, yeah, I wish I had an answer. It, it's, it's a challenge. <laughs> well, if we had the answers, we wouldn't have to discuss it. But um, <laughs> so, do you think, um, so maybe another idea uh, one of our, um, uh, our viewers has said is to maybe change the way we look at um, heritage in many ways. Some of Cornwall's built heritage has more recent uses. For example, sites that have attracted creative industries, artists and musicians. These recent uses provide opportunities for interpretation. 
e.g. artists take inspiration from buildings in a landscape, etc. To what extent do you feel that this more recent living history is important and will it be included in this um, monument improvement project? Um, I, I mean, if, just from a wider perspective, and because uh, I know there is some, there are plans, aren't uh, for the actual project itself, but I, I don't know whether uh, James, whether you might be, or, or Ian might be a little bit better place to uh, talk about that. I know, but I know from a um, uh, from a sort of a wider setting, um, uh, very much so in in terms of um, the uh, the utilisation of the of uh, our so. Sort of uh, particularly in Cornwall, you know, with the, the very dramatic uh, landscapes that we have that aren't just, you know, uh, as I was saying right, right early on, aren't just natural in their form. There, there's the archaeology, the living history is very extant. Um, it's all above ground, you know, whether it's the uh, engine houses, prehistoric barrows, field systems, in lots of other parts of the country where there's more intensive agriculture. And everything's everything can be a little bit more subtle and buried, whereas there's down here it's it's very much there and in your face, and you know has been unsurprisingly an inspiration and a um, a, a driving force behind various artistic movements <laughs> down here over the over the centuries. Um, and uh, I think, I mean, just speaking for the trust sake, um, is very much em embraced and encouraged. I mean, there's been recent projects I think there's been, there was a recent film project um, in 2019 um, down in West Cornwall you know exploring um, local identity and connection um, you know that was based around sort of interviews and understanding um, within a community um, through to possibly sort of more you know radical interpretations um, providing spaces for um, uh, new art, conceptual art, things like that, you know, and, and sitting them within the context of, um, you know, whether it's sort of ruinous structures or or large barns or things like, things like that. Um, uh, definitely, um, uh, you know, is encouraged and and is explored. I think you know, it's, it, and sometimes the controversialness of it, um, it you know, is is um, deliberately explored to promote that you know the conversations that that come from that as well but i think yeah i think, I think go on. sorry sorry jim yeah i, th I you're, you're quite right and um, we're not really quite sure how how we're going to go about it yet for the monumental improvement project although you know it will start having lots of ideas for the delivery stage of the project we certainly want to want to make the the sites that we're investigating uh, part of the you know the living landscape really and explore how people use them today and uh, have used them in the past um, but I think what what we really want to do is with every landscape we look at use it as a backdrop to um, all these different all these very really varied kind of disciplines like um, art and music and everything else and as Jim said um, the Cornish landscape and its drama really lends itself to to um, all of those different um, disciplines and interpretations and a good example would be the work that we carried out at um, Carwin and Coit a few years ago for the Sustainable Trust um, developed by the Sustainable Trust employed CAU to help lead the archaeology but what it really was was a was a, a backdrop for artists and writers and musicians and everybody to come together into that field um, and really feed off feed off the um, you know the historic culture that we were exploring really and um, for which for which we won a very prestigious <laughs> award. <laughs> uh, and um, and uh, when it comes to um, and when it comes to working on sites that have had a very kind of uh, dramatic and controversial history, we, we just um, uh, had confirmation that we're going to be able to include um, some further work at St Piran's Oratory um, as part of the Monumental Improvement Project, a site I've been working on now for the last um, six years. And, um, uh, you know, we're, we're entering a kind of a conservation stage of that project. When we initiated that for the St Piran Trust, 
uh, we had certainly had no shortage of volunteers and had over 80 people willingly coming out in the wind and the rain and with their shovels uh, digging away the sand off that monument. Um, and what we've explored since then is not just its medieval history and origins, but also um, how important it became as a Cornish um, icon, if you like, as kind of site of iconic status uh, from the Victorian period right up to the present day. So, um, so yeah, all these these things are really relevant. And it's also not not forgetting that the you know the the benefits of programs like like this one is is not just in the um, in the doing of it it's it's also the you know obviously as archaeologists we're we're keen to learn and understand but also that that information um goes out there into the wider world very much to you know uh for there for inspiration you know for for all the sort of other creative industries so the whole point is to try and get more there for people to feed off and and to understand whether that's on a personal basis or you know or, or on a um yeah, personal health basis or on a sort of more creative basis i mean it, you know a good a good example would be something like the um the theater project uh run a few years ago down at levant called um levant mine called the trench now you know people wouldn't initially associate it, you know the mine with um with world war one but the the mine um, sort of temporarily closed down or have real trouble recruiting because obviously all the uh, men were recruited to um, uh, go off to uh, fight in the trenches. And so they had a very much a, a live theatre piece down there where people went down and you actively participated. You were dressed up in clothes, you took on a role and you were then, you know, ordered around by a sergeant major. And, and, and you know, this went, the theatre production went on for, you know, a good couple of weeks and people are out there and you know come rain or shine and obviously each had its own <laughs> uh d desired effect i'm sure a windy stormy day um and levant you know dressed up being ordered around by a sergeant major um it's not not gonna it's gonna impress itself on your mind but yeah that you know it it does uh, but that's all come from the information that, that was gleaned from some further study and and so yeah so programs like this monumental improvement one will helpfully you know provide that kind of yeah. And do you think it's a real um, benefit to Cornwall as a whole in terms of um, a great place to live, work and visit? You know, is it benefiting the economy? Have you seen that, that in, in any places already where it's actually helped the, uh, you know, brought people to Cornwall, made people spend? Um, uh, on a, uh, uh, it's difficult to say, uh, difficult to compare for the last year. Obviously, um, Cornwall has a kind of national rep uh, reputation um, uh, and, and has for a, a long history as a as a s s place of tourism. Um, I think this kind of work does highlight that there is uh, going back to an earlier question about you know how do you divert a visitor from going to Land's End or you know go, going to the the main honeypot sites. That you know obviously the more information we have, the more the more images and a bit of understanding, which might create a bit more interest to go and visit some of the um, wider landscape stuff. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, I wouldn't want to, it, obviously with more people coming down, it creates more, more business and more job opportunities as a result and all of that. Um, but, you know, I think all of this has got to run in parallel with, uh, sometimes the maybe divorce connections that people who live in Cornwall themselves have with place. And, you know, a lot of that, um, I'm sure people have been reflecting a lot more on that over, over the past past year, being a bit more homebound. And I, th I think you know the the um, wider tourism question should also be linked in with how how we link and work with um, communities. Um, sometimes creating you know bridges between communities. Archaeology's got this again. This this real it it, it can tell. Uh, stories it can bring you to places that are sometimes bridging between you know sometimes the the rural and the urban uh for example and things like that and making those connections um you know it is equally beneficial to maybe how we sort of work rest and play using a mars advert phrase well 
thank you for ending us on a Mars advert. Um, <laughs> we, have come, uh, we have come to an hour, an hour, and um, I'm afraid we could go on all day chatting away, um, but we will let you all be free. Um, so just to uh, everyone watching, uh, I really uh, appreciate, or we all appreciate you coming uh, along to watch us today. Um, this is the first webinar of the Monu uh, Monumental Improvement Project. If you'd like to find out more about the project, you can visit uh, our page on the Cornwall AOMB website. If you'd like to hear more about some of the other projects discussed today, ask a question, or uh, you can speak to the Monumental Improvement team about volunteering opportunities. And you can email, um, email uh, us at monuments at cornwall-aomb.gov.uk. Um, and don't worry, we will send you a follow-up email just with those details in. So no need to get writing right now. Uh, thank you very much to all of our guests here today. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.